Our scripture for today is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. We've been some months now in Romans chapter 12 and will yet be some months in it as the Lord wills and directs. This important chapter of of Romans really falls, as we have previously noted, into three broad divisions. It begins by talking about our individual consecration. This is in view of all that's been said about how our salvation has been won in Christ. Paul, for example, does not exhort us at the beginning of the Romans letter to be aglow with the Spirit, to serve the Lord, to rejoice in hope, to let love be genuine, because that would only contribute to an understanding of the idea that salvation is something we accomplish. Rather, our motivation and our ethics as believers flow out of that true realization of God's grace and we have been forgiven and accepted and it's not what we do, it's what Christ does that makes the difference. Having started with that basis in Romans 1-11 through 11, as he begins chapter 12, the first two verses, individual consecration, it's the foundation of all of our experience together as a body for as if we are not individually committed to Christ, it will be impossible for us to achieve within Christian community within the church, what God wants. And then verses 3 through 8, which speaks of our uniqueness in Christian community, the discovering of our gifts, the ways in which we bless one another as the body of Christ. And then we come to the third major section of this chapter, which speaks of, if you will, the universals in Christian community, the kinds of experiences and attitudes and values which we are all to cherish and have, practice among, among us, It is the assumption throughout this 12th chapter of Romans that the church, as a living organism, is so fundamentally different from the idea of an audience. An audience can go to a theater or to a dramatic production and it really doesn't matter that there is any interrelationship among the people that are there. They simply come to see what is going on up front and they can go back to their separate ways, never having bothered to attempt to establish any kind of relationship with one another, either inside of the building or outside of the building. The church is far different. It, of course, is not an audience. It is a body. And as Paul has indicated in verse 3, or verse 4, in one body we have many members. Now, I'm teaching a class in preaching beginning in a a week or two, and I'm saying this in advance because I want those that are taking the course not to critique this sermon. (laughs) As I'm going to give, in homiletics, I'm going to break a a, a fundamental rule by giving a long introduction which is almost as long as the body of the sermon itself, and that you're not supposed to do. So I haven't gotten my conscience clear on that. I just uh, feel constrained to spend just a little bit more time in ministering on this subject of what it means to be a body, because this is where we're at now in the experience of our church. God has put many, many people together in rather rapid fashion. We can, we're kind of at a dividing of the roads, if you will. We can choose to be an audience, or we can continue to make those sorts of choices which will weld us together as a body, New Testament church, if you will. I'm learning a little bit about the body of Christ through watching what's happening in my own body because for the last ten days I've had a... My back has just gone out on me. It just does that sometimes. It just went out. And I've been creaking along and and going along at a kind of a perpendicular angle or I don't know what angle it was. But And today I can stand straight and I've been able to stand in ten days. And I want to thank you all for praying for me. But as I was going through this bad back, I thought, surely, Lord, there must be a theological lesson uh, in this, some sermon illustration where to, to redeem the time and all this time suffering with this crazy thing must have some redemptive purpose. So I, at the introduction of this sermon, have four theological lessons from a bad back which relate to the concept of the church as a body. <laughs> First lesson is this. There would be no problem if the parts of the body were not interconnected. I mean... If my, bo- if my back here wasn't connected to the rest of me, it wouldn't bother me that it hurt because what I could do is just simply put it on the wall in my office and there's my spine hanging there and I could look at it. I could say, hurt! 
doesn't bother me. But on the other hand, if I had no spine, there would be no me. So you can't take that out of me and still have me. And the same way with each of us in the church, we, you know, there would never be any problems in the church. There would never be any strife or discontent or, or anything if it weren't for us. <laughs> if you just take us out individually, it would be a perfect church. But then we wouldn't have a church, would we? So if there's going to be an interconnection of the parts, we need to be aware of the fact that most of the time, most all the parts are healthy. Every once in a while, there comes along a part that needs attention. And our being interconnected means we give it the attention. Now, I would rather have a sick back than no back at all. And I would rather in this interconnection of the parts see within our fellowship those who are hurting and not all well emotionally and maybe even in relationships with other believers in the congregation aren't where they ought to be. I'd, I'd rather have you and me when I get that way as part of the church than not part of the church at all because we're interrelated. I like the phrase, and you'll forgive me for using it, but someone has said the church is sometimes like Noah's Ark. You heard this? If it weren't for the storm outside, you couldn't stand the smell within. <laughs> There's a terrible storm out there in the world. <laughs> and I really don't think there's much smell in this congregation. <laughs> Remarkably healthy body, which we praise the Lord and want to continue seeing it go that way. But we're not... The continual word that is used to describe us as believers in the body of Christ is maturing believers. Not perfect believers. Now that's our goal. But we recognize when something slips with one of the parts that, thank God, the part is there to slip. Thank God we have it. We're interconnected. And it's just so important within our, our midst as a congregation that, that we recognize, indeed, that God has called us to an interconnectedness, that, we're, that, that the Lord did not design the Christian life to be lived alone. Well, a second theological lesson about a bad back is that when one member of the body is not functioning, the whole body hurts. Now, of course, if the parts aren't interconnected, they can't feel it when, when one part is hurting. This is why we're going to be placing a good deal of stress this year on, on seeing the kinds of mechanisms come, into, come more greatly into being that help us experience community together. But I know when my back is hurt that it bothers the rest of my body. Two things it does to the rest of my body. The rest of my body experiences pain. And other parts of my body are denied pleasure. Like, for example, right now my eye is extremely angry at my back because the back has denied it pleasure this last week. Because the eye likes to, once a week or so, get out and see the beautiful blue sky and the green grass and a little white ball that rolls along the grass. And my eye is extremely upset with my back. <laughs> On the other hand, when, when my body is well, when my back is well, it, the eye tends to take things for granted. The eye does not go along saying, as it's walking along the fairway, uh, thanks back for doing a good job. Appreciate you. Just keep, keep on functioning. And that's often it is the way in, in, in community where... We don't really become as acutely aware of one another until a hurt develops. This is why there's a tremendous need, by the way, for exhorters to keep encouraging us to keep going when everything's going all right. Um, my back, on the other hand, doesn't say when everything's going well, well, the eye hasn't said thanks to me lately, I'm going to fix it. <laughs> God has so put us together in body, the body of Christ, that it is intended that when we're, we're functioning in body, that when one part hurts, the rest hurts. Now, the third thing about the bad back, theologically. The function of one member is subordinated to the purpose of all the members or the purpose of all the body. Now, if you ask my back what its principal purpose was, it would probably answer back, my principal purpose, George Wood, is to hold you up. If you ask my body what its principal purpose was, it would respond, my purpose is to make you live. Now, when we have looked at Romans 6 through 8, we have been looking at specific functions in the body. But uh, while that may be a specific function, 
for a person to be an exhorter or a teacher or a prophet or a server or a contributor or a giver of mercy or exercising leadership, uh, that is not the fundamental purpose of the body. You see, your fundamental purpose is not to go out and say, I've got a gift. That's an important way that the body functions, but the overall purpose of the body is to, the overall purpose of this church is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and to edify the saints and to evangelize the lost and to meet human need and, and all of the functional gifts relate somehow to those overall broad purposes. And we would do amiss if we begin saying, well, you know, my function is why the body exists. No, the body exists and my function is there to help it accomplish its overall goals. Thank the Lord, my back is now better behaving and is holding me up. But it does so only because my body is at work wanting to give me life. How can this, how, what do we mean when I say it is our fundamental purpose to glorify God? I noticed a lot of children are in the uh, congregation today, and I grew up as a child in church, sitting like many of you children here, hearing that word glory. I could never figure out what glory was. I'm still not so sure I've got it all figured out. But uh, kind of a thing that has struck me from the ministry of Jesus, which helps me understand the word glory, is that when Jesus finished in his priestly prayer of John 17, just before he went to the cross, he says to the Father, I have glorified thee on earth. And what I think he meant by that was simply... Father, I have lived life in such a way and I have taught in such a way that I have left a complete and accurate representation of what you are like. If anyone wants to know what God is truly like, then I have represented you. I have glorified you for I have manifested what you are. And, and that is the calling of the people of God individually and corporately that in the world, people that are searching for what life is, what truth is, what love is experienced, can look at us as individuals and then look at us as a church, as a body, and say, well, if you, what, a, what an understanding of God those people reflect and relate. And of course the world will judge us not by our doctrine primarily, they're going to judge us more on our relationships, by our love. Jesus invited us to use that as the test the, invited the world to use that as the test by whether or not we are disciples of Christ. Now, just a fourth quick thing on the body, on the back. If you want a sick member to get well, then take the pressure off. <laughs> Doesn't do any good if my back is not feeling good to say, get going on an 18-hour day and do go out and ride your bicycle. It's good to just get get lying on the back and get the pressure off. And I think Sometimes it's possible, and preachers are notoriously guilty of this, of dumping guilt upon people instead of letting the Holy Spirit put the guilt there. Remember, I appreciate in this church the people have come to me when they don't agree with something I do or say. I would encourage you to do that. Maybe one a week, no more than that. <laughs> That's immensely valuable for me to get this kind of fee feedback. Don't be scared. To come to me. I, I'm, I'm not, I won't bite your head off. Maybe your hand, but not your head. <laughs> Several years ago, a member of this congregation came to me and said, Pastor, you always end your sermons on a down note. We leave so guilty. Well, we've come to church, we've listened to you, and we know now we've failed God again. Now, so we go out. And I hadn't even realized I was doing that, but it, as I analyzed what I was doing, inevitably I was implying well, what I was preaching, that people weren't really doing it, and so I had to lay it on, putting the pressure on. And the Lord said, now wait a minute, that's not the way I taught, that's not the way I ministered. You don't, if you're a member of the body and you're going through struggles, then it's not our responsibility as the body to put a lot of pressure upon you and tell you, get with it. It's, uh, we were to nourish and cherish you and, and exhort you and give you rest. But woe to you if, you, if a well member pretends to be sick. Then there's a legitimate exercise of putting the pressure on. We want to be careful and sensitive to one another in the body. Now, that's, that's what I wanted to say on theological lessons of a bad back. I'm going to come to the text that I read. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Paul in verses 
12, or verse, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, really divides the sphere of love into two parts. In verses 9 through 13, he tells us what love looks like when it is practiced in the family of God. And in verses 14 through 21, he tells us what love looks like when it is on display in the world. And his lead theme is, let love be genuine. Now, you notice as you go through verses 9 through 21, there's a whole series of exhortations. And it looks like they're all of equal value. Let love be genuine, hate what is good, hold, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, etc., etc. But if you, if you understand that the first phrase, let love be genuine, is the heading for the whole theme, all of the rest of the phrases that flow out of verse 9 through 21 are an exposition of what it means for love to be genuine. You see, in loving, the apostle is assuming that loving in Christian community does not happen automatically. Now, I know as a teenager when I fell in love, it happened automatically. But I know now as a married person, a father, that, that love not only happens automatically, but it, it needs to be worked on. So Paul proceeds in describing what love looks like in the family of God to, pers- to go on to give us 12 indications of how to love, just in verses 9 13 through 13 alone. And the words love one another themselves occur some 16 times in the New Testament. Now if love among believers ha- happened automatically, what in the world is the New Testament telling us 16 times to love one another. Jesus alone in the Gospel of John five times tells us to love one another. And the assumption behind those instructions is that it does not happen automatically. Love no more happens automatically than, I guess, giving to the Lord happens automatically. It's kind of been a real lesson for me to see the aftermath of Malcolm McGregor's being with us at the end of November. Because for seven years I had managed in my seven years as pastor here to preach one sermon on tithing. And that was at the request of the congregation last January. And I just assume that, that if we all give attention to the Scripture, you know, it just will happen automatically. And I, I have been absolutely shocked to find out, after Malcolm McGregor left and taught on the subject, that it wasn't evidently happening automatically because something wild has happened to the income of the church in the last four weeks. And I guess love doesn't happen any more automatically than tithing happens automatically. There must be some exposition, some development, and so my purpose is to give myself to this. Love, of course, in our church body is going to have a depth and a breadth. There are going to be some whom you are called to be extremely close to. It's, you know, how many people are in this room? Four, five hundred, something like that? You cannot get close to all of these people in this room. You can maybe, if we go through with some of the plans we're working on, we want to develop a Polaroid bulletin board out here, we get everybody's picture out there. Every family, and alphabetize. It's just a huge thing, you know. And then, when, and, and then when you don't know somebody, you can kind of go out there and stare at it until you, until you figure out who they are. And that way, maybe in breadth, you'll get to know everybody and you'll be able to just kind of touch a lot of people. And that's, that's a beautiful exercise of love, to, to have that kind of breadth. But love also needs depth uh, to say that uh, with some, we're going to sink in in deeper relationships that God has called us to. And it's very important that we seek a climate in our church in which love is so very easily expressed, whether it's in depth or in breadth. We tried to do this just at, even at the close of a Sunday morning worship service by saying, give a hearty handshake, a healthy hug, or a holy kiss. I was reading a sermon by Ray Stedman, who pastors Peninsula Bible Church in Palo Alto, and he preached a sermon on this particular text and called it, How to Hug. And uh, he said something like, he said he wanted to comment on the title of his message, How to Hug, it was suggested to me by a story I once heard about a man who was walking down the street. He passed a used bookstore, and in the window he saw a book with this title, How to Hug. He was taken by the title, and being of a somewhat romantic nature, went in to buy the book. But to his chagrin, he discovered that it was the third volume of an encyclopedia and covered the subjects, How to Hug. <laughs> Stedman goes on to say that I often thought, as I think of that story, that the church is like that. Everyone knows that the church is a place where love ought to be manifested, and many people have come to church hoping to find a demonstration of love, only to discover an encyclopedia of theology. But I am grateful God is changing that today. Thank God, he says, 
Now, this is not even a charismatic church, by the way. Thank God that, that hugs are returning to the churches. Here we often greet each other with a hug, and I think that is great. In the early church, the Christians actually greeted one another with a holy kiss. You don't see that too often these days, Stephen says, but perhaps it's coming back. At least we've begun to hug one another. Once in a while, you see somebody greet someone with a kiss. I don't know if it's holy or not, but we have at least begun to hug. That's great, because that's what the church is to be like. Love does not happen automatically. And Paul says love is to be genuine. There's nothing said about love being perfect, just love being genuine. And the word for genuine here is literally without hypocrisy. Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 demonstrated a love with hypocrisy, a love that was not genuine. They acted like they were really loving when they weren't really doing that at all. Love is a non-genuine love if love is simply spoken but not meant. To say I love you and not mean it is to exercise a non-genuine love or love which is only spoken and not done indeed. Genuine love, true love, is sincere. And indeed a, a way of understanding Paul's phrase let love be genuine is to say let love be sincere. This word which we use in English, sincere, which helps carry the idea of the word genuine, is a word which originally comes from the Latin, sinceras. It, it actually sincere in its Latinized form meant without wax. That's what the meaning of the word is. In the early Rome, merchants set out their earthen and porcelain jars for sale. If a crack appeared in a jar, then they would fill it with wax. And, and the color of the wax, the same color as the porcelain vase, so as to hide the defect. And uh, a person would buy it, and of course they wouldn't have it for long and discover that indeed there was a great crack in it as the wax would melt away. So persons used to learn to become rather astute buyers of pottery and porcelain. And finally some of the merchants got onto this that there were people that wanted reputable products. So they guaranteed that their product was not have any wax covering any fissure and they stamped on the pottery jar, sinceris, which means without wax. And that embodies the kind of concept Paul is talking here about love. Let love be genuine. Let it be unfeigned. Let it not be make-believe or put on, but really mean what you say and really do what you indicate. With that, Paul gives a manifestation of love. Uh, as he starts detailing how love functions, he immediately takes off two characteristics. A genuine love will hate what is evil, and a genuine love, on the other hand, will hold fast to what is good. Hate is a true expression of love. In fact, I'm going to make a rather bold statement here. If you do not know how to hate, I really would question whether you know how to love. Because hatred and love flow out of that same mix in the depths of the volcano, volcano, volcano of the soul, really. Like, I take for example, the son of Sam, David Berkowitz. I was reading the story of his father, uh, who is just... Uh, oh, how, how would you feel if you were the father of a boy that you thought you'd brought up right and he turned out to be the killer of all these people in New York City? How would you feel? And this, this father of David Berkowitz has had this terrible dilemma of still loving his son, but deploring what his son has done. In fact, he was, he, was so, he was so at a loss as to what his son had done that with his wife, he was going to move out of a set of condominiums that, that they managed. And he came back from visiting his son in New York. I believe they live in, in Colorado, if I remember the story correctly. And the tenements, or the, the tenants, rather, of, of that place had taken a vote among themselves and unanimously agreed and they put a letter on his door that asked them, please do not move, please do not leave, we love you and we understand. Here is this dad, who if he loves his son at all, with that love is going to have a profound hatred, a hatred for what he did, but a deep love yet for his son. This is the kind of thing that Paul is talking about kind of thing which Jesus continually expressed in his ministry. Paul is not saying hate who is evil, but rather hate what is evil. There, 
are two words that Paul could have used for hatred here. One is a kind of a concealed hatred and the other is an expressed hatred which carries the idea of loathing or deploring. And it's here that he uses the latter term. Loathe evil. When you see it in your life, when you see it in the body of Christ, loathe it, but don't reject the person. And that's why Paul goes on to the third admonition. Hold fast to what is good. The idea of holding fast is, could be translated by words like be wedded to what is good, be joined to what is good, be cleaving to what is good, even perhaps cemented to what is good. It is the balance to the idea of hating. I went through an experience in my life, and many of you know that I spent some teenage years and some college years in a rather religious town. And uh, a town where church headquarters were located, I went to a church-related college. And you know, there's, there's one tremendous failing that often takes place when Christians gather together if they're not careful to work on it. Because the Lord... Uh, I shouldn't say the Lord at this point. Maybe I'll say the devil. The devil doesn't work on communities of Christians so much from the aspect of sensual sin. Though here and there we read about someone that falls into gross sensual sin. But by and large, he works against Christian community through spiritual sins. Especially through sins of pride especially through sins which involve domineering other people and stepping over of them and playing games like one person is more important than another and doing things which are discourteous and unkind and proud. And as a young person growing up in that kind of an atmosphere, I saw that from time to time. And I guess instinctively in me, I reached out to do what Paul is saying, hate what is evil. Boy, it made me mad. I was the expert in diagnosing hypocrisy. <laughs> kind of strikes me now that every once in a while, now I'm no longer the critic of the system, but as pastor of a, of a church, realize that maybe even people can, can sometimes see inconsistency in my own life and think that of me. Of course, there was a time when I didn't have inconsistency, you see. <laughs> in this beautiful ability to recognize all the hypocrites. I, I hated what was evil. But if you stay on that fixation, then you don't have love which is genuine because it's, there's an imbalance to it. For you must, in addition to hating what is evil, hold fast to what is good. You must be able to look at a situation, whether it's an individual believer or a body of believers, and not only have the perception to see what may be wrong that needs to be corrected, but also to see what is right and what can be built upon, the things which are true, the things which are just, the things which are pure and honorable. You need to look at those and hold fast to that which is good. And I kind of got a closure, a reconciliation on this when I was leaving college as a senior and I'm one of these kinds of persons that gets sentimental and writes poetry or something like that to celebrate an occasion. And upon the occasion of my graduation from college, I wrote what to me was a long epic poem, about three or four pages, in which I reviewed my college career. And as I was leaving the circumstances that I had gone to school in, I said this line, and it kind of strikes me as being related to this text. I said this line, There was too much good to reckon with the bad. Too much good. Now, a prophet, if we go back to the ministry of prophecy, which we developed several weeks ago, is going to have a tendency to see what is wrong. Hopefully they'll see what's right. And it's possible within Christian community, as we seek to build what God has called us to do, that you can at certain times in your experience really focus in on things that are deficient. And you can see things that are deficient in my life, in the life of the church, in the life of other believers, or other Christian organizations, or whatever. And you need to be discerning. God doesn't call us to unscrew our head and deposit it in the church foyer when we come into the church building and pick it up on the way back out. He calls us to use all of our faculties. But with all that discernment and prophesying, hold fast what is good. Build upon what God is doing and praise Him for it and build one another up. Doesn't the Lord do this with Peter? He takes this man in whom there was so much that was wrong and putty and turns him into solid rock possible to get your eye on the evil and you do not see what's right. God wants you to hold fast what is good. Three good guides for the new year. Let love be sincere. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Let's pray.
There is, Lord, as we gather today, and just uh, an air of expectancy in, in our hearts. I know it's in my heart. I feel that over these past years in our church body, you've been collecting us for a purpose. We've come from backgrounds that are different. Each of us has been saved differently, and each of us has been led to this body differently. Somehow we've all got here at this moment in time. And I guess I really feel, Lord, like we're at that point in our own experience as we're the 120 believers in Acts chapter 1. For years you had laid a foundation. It was, it, and, and in those three years' time, you, you just had a small, dedicated company. But in that company, there were persons whose hearts were aglow and who knew that you were Lord. And we know that today. We know that you are risen from the dead. And we know that you have called us. And now at the outset of this year, we don't know what you have in store for us, Lord. And honestly, we have tried to make our hearts ready for anything. We want to be flexible, Lord. And not put upon ourselves or upon this church worldly expectations. We simply want to be what you want us to be. Lord, if that involves over this coming year our church body growing in a way that would allow us to start 20 new churches and this church would go down to 50 people in order to do it, have your will, Lord. We don't need to build anything. But let us be used of you, Lord. And let your Spirit come upon us because we are truly gathered in this one, in this place. And there is truly, I sense, one Spirit in this place. The Spirit of the Lord. And let your Spirit energize, empower us as individuals and as a church in this new year that we could rise up with strength spiritually to do your will and to serve you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.